paper itself, and I'd go through the pros and cons of introducing that particular variation to the DSG model that Martin has done, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about the actual use of DSG models themselves to begin with. And I don't know if anybody here is old enough as, as me to remember when macroeconomics used to be about using aggregate supply and aggregate demand models or ISLM models and so on. I think most of you uh, have trained at the stage when DSG models were all that there were. And I wonder if you ever wonder where the hell they came from. Well, if you take a good look in the literature, you'll say it came out of the objective that people like particularly Lucas and Sargent had to base macroeconomics on microeconomics. The argument was, right from the 1970s, that macroeconomics had bad micro foundations. And Lucas put this very nicely in his presidential address back in actually a talk to the um, History of Political Economy Conference back in 2004. Very extemporary. This is actually just his transcribed comments. He didn't have a, a paper. He said nobody was satisfied with ISLM as the end of modelling. Uh, the idea was we were going to tie it with microeconomics. That was the objective. So what DSG models really are, are macroeconomic models that are built up from micro concepts and you add in imperfections to make them do something interesting apart from tell you everything in general equilibrium, go home, don't let the government do anything, which is what you get out of real business cycle models. So can you logically derive macro from micro? And most economists think, of course you can. Well, you can if it's possible to go seamlessly from what applies at the micro level to the macro level. And some very, very good neoclassical, highly mathematical economists, you see the name de Brewer there, I don't need to tell you about him, but Sonnenschein and Nandor probably played a leading role, Ex explored that. And the starting point was we know that at the, the level of a, a single individual, if you're working out a Hicksian compensated demand curve for a single individual, yes, you can guarantee that you get a downward sloping demand curve. So the law of demand applies. The question they asked was, does that apply if you expand it to multiple rational agents with multiple commodities? And the answer was categorically no. Categorically, you cannot do it. The way that Sonnenschein put it, probably the clearest statement you can find in the literature of it, was to say that he proved that every polynomial, and you know what a polynomial is, it's what you can draw on a piece of paper without taking a pen off the page, without crossing back over and without getting two values for one X input. That's a polynomial. He said any polynomial can be an excess demand function for some commodity in some end commodity world. So any continuous function you can draw. Now, of course, that means the curve can go up, down, wobble, go higher, go lower. Anything you damn well like can be a demand curve. That is not what you get if you, if you treat the entire economy as a single utility maximising agent. So you get this paradox, or apparent paradox, it's actually a very common one, that if you aggregate a large number of individuals who all obey the law of demand, you're going to market, let alone an entire economy, you get market demand curves that don't obey the law of demand. And that's a well-established, very, very sound result in the literature. Now, most economists don't even know this literature, but those that do, I think, take a pretty silly reaction to it let's rationalise, let's assume, etc., etc. The best reaction, I think, came from Alan Kerman. And he said that if we're going to take this seriously, it means we simply have to work at a higher level of aggregation. We can't lump everybody into one barrel, but we can lump all wealthy people in one barrel, all poor in another, all bankers in a third, etc., etc. He said the idea that we have to start from the isolated individual may be an idea we have to abandon. And that's what we should have done when this was the serum was realised 40 years ago. Now, in practice, that wasn't what was done. Instead, this fiction of the representative agent came about. And how on earth did that happen? I mean, if you take a look at uh, Varian. Did anybody here read Varian in their education? Okay, very few. Most of you read Maskell, am I right? Okay, that thousand-page tome. Okay. Well, take a good look at a pivotal section there called Anything Goes. Maskell, to his credit, and normally I criticise him, to his credit, is completely thorough on this literature. And if you turn to page 602, I think, you'll find him stating precisely this theorem in the book that taught you how to do micro and taught you macro on top of that micro foundation. 
is that any arbitrary function can be a demand curve. So the whole foundation of modelling the entire economy as a single agent, or even doing multiple agents where they don't necessarily differ in social class, is invalid and has been known to be so for over 40 years. So you can't derive macroeconomics from micro. Now, this is not an uncommon result. This should have been the point at which economics joined the sciences, because the sciences realised this again about 40 to 50 years ago. I'm about to quote from a paper uh, written by a, a genuine Nobel Prize winner. You all know the other ones are fiction, don't you? The Nobel Prize Philip Anderson in physics wrote a wonderful paper called More is Different. And he argued that having attempted for quite some time to reduce everything to quantum mechanics, physicists realised that simply couldn't be done. And the only way they could understand it was by saying that the behaviour of a large number of even identical particles cannot be reduced to the a summation of the behaviour of those like particles in isolation. And in a beautiful way, the sonnenschein mantel gruber conditions prove that for economics. is one of the best instances of emergent properties I've ever found. It should have been a point of maturity for economics to move on from that to realise you can't do what economists have always tried to do, which is what could be called strong reductionism. And that's, again, the ter a term from uh, uh, Phillips um, Anderson's paper. And he said, instead, what happens at each new level, you get new complexities that apply all the way up. Now, he said, you can you imagine ranking the sciences in such a way that you can have a table where you'd say the elementary entities of one science, like X, let's say that's chemistry, obey the laws of another science, Y, well, that would be physics. So we're going to be talking about interacting molecules, the molecules themselves, or the, the atoms in those molecules obey the laws of physics. But he says that doesn't mean that science X is just applied Y. At each new level, new generalizations, new concepts come to the fore, which are just as difficult and require just as much creativity as the previous ones. And he finished with a statement of saying psychology is not applied biology, and nor is biology applied chemistry. Now, I'll give you a little way to think about this. If it was true that you could do that reductionism, then a typical biology question would Please arrange these chemicals to create life. Okay? Doesn't happen. Well, just as psychology is not applied biology, economics in economics, macro is not applied micro. It has to be something different. Now, what, what is going on when we try to build economics this way? And really, we can date this back to Adam Smith. It's something we've been doing since Smith. Not with Ricardo and Marx, but right back to Smith. It's constructionism. It's trying to build the level of analysis we wish to work at from the level below it. You know, and that's an example, of course, you've got to, you know, to do chemistry, to do biology, you've really got to be able to create life out of innate chemicals, which, of course, is nonsense. But we think it's sensible to reduce macro to micro. So you, you cannot work up from a bottom level to the high level. You must have a science or a discipline relevant to the level you're working at. And for that, the entire DSGE is a failed agenda. And it really took, I, I would have thought, the financial crisis to prove how failed that was, because that was one of the many reasons why conventional economists didn't see the crisis coming. Now, not all conventional economists can be tarred with a brush on tarring here. One who can't, of all people, is Robert Solow. I don't know how many of you realise this, but he rejects DSGE even more violently than I'm doing right now. And he's been trying for a dozen or more years to get economists to realise they can't build macroeconomic models based on the growth model that he himself constructed. That's what you're doing. And this is his description. He says, the preferred model has a single consumer optimizing over infinite time with perfect foresight uh, in an environment which realizes the plans more or less flawlessly with perfectly competitive markets, etc., etc. He's talking there about the real business cycle version, of course, but he's just as dismissive of the new Keynesian versions later on. His punchline is, how can anyone expect a sensible short to medium run macroeconomics to come out of that setup? And he also criticises the fixation upon equilibrium, which is something which I think is probably the, if, if the, the defining fallacy in economics is to mistake identity conditions for equilibria. But here's Solar making a similar point. The choice between thinking you should be thinking in equilibrium or disequilibrium he thinks is a false choice 
And he's a beautiful example. This is a talk he gave, um, forgotten, I think it was for Stiglitz, a Theshrit for Stiglitz, held on the 15th floor of a building in MIT. And he said, if I drop a watermelon out this window, I could probably describe its process towards the ground as an equilibrium process. That wouldn't do the watermelon much good when it hit the ground. Okay? It wasn't the most fruitful, he says, sorry, way of describing the falling watermelon phenomenon. So we have to also be about disequilibrium. And again, let's go back to a previous time when we realised this, this point in dire circumstances, the Great Depression. This is Irving Fisher. After he lost his fortune with the Wall Street crash, trying to understand where his thinking led him, led him astray. And he realised that equilibrium thinking was the major flaw because he said, even if you believe everything does tend towards equilibrium, New shocks are going to come along, so things will always be above or below their equilibrium at any point in time. And therefore, you have to be working from a situation of being out of equilibrium if you're going to be analysing a living system like the economy. Now, that gets us into complexity, because then we're talking about far from equilibrium behaviour, not the equilibrium fixation of neoclassical economics, but dynamics of systems which obey identities. There's no violation of identities going on here, but they're out of equilibrium all the time. And you also have, of course, what, what meteorologists had to get used to, which was sensitive dependence upon initial conditions, a limited um, capacity to forecast forward and so on. Now, most economists haven't seen systems like this. So I'm going to show the simplest, the very first one we realised, which was Lorenz's model of turbulent flow. There's three equations there, three differential equations, with three parameters. It's very hard to get a simpler model than that. But if you simulate that system and you start in equilibrium, which I'll do in this model, then you get something that looks really like an economic model. Absolutely bloody nothing happens. Okay? What about if I get a little jolt? Then it looks rather different. I'm going to let that run. I'll come back to it when I finish talking, and you'll see that uh, it never settles down permanently in disequilibrium. That's the real world. And that's what economists should be modelling rather than the fantasy of equilibrium. Ultimately, you'll see a pattern like that turn up in the simulation, and it's commonplace in genuine sciences to expect that sort of behaviour out of a complex system. It's about time economists caught up with that. Um, I think it'll be many, many decades before they do, unfortunately. I'm going to finish with a final word for, for uh, Solo. Just give you an idea of just how strongly one of the grand masters of conventional neoclassical economics has been trying to attack DSGE and not being listened to by the profession. Because that, I mentioned that paper he gave. Have a look at the title. Dumb and Dumber in Macroeconomics. So let's get wise and start using dynamics and consign DSGE to the dustbin of economic history. Thank you. <laughs>